What up? This is Rama Screen, and in the anticipation of the cleansing hour, which arrives on VOD, digital HD, and DVD January 19th, I'm here talking with the co-writer, director of this film, Damien Levesque. How are you, Damien? Doing great. Thanks for having me on, Rama. Good, good, good. Thank you for taking the time. So I'm going to cut to the chase here. I read um, the list of the bonus features on the upcoming DVD release of this film. And one of the bonus features listed is the cleansing hour short film. So here's the egg and the chicken question here. Which one came first, the short film or the movie? I made the short film in 2015 and 2016 as a proof of concept for the feature film. So, um, you know, plot wise, there's a lot of similarity between the short and the feature. Um, but that was one of the, what I used as the sales tool to help get the feature film made. Oh, I see, I see. And uh, how drastic is the adjustments or the alterations uh, from the short film onto the, to the big version? Well, I mean, I would say pretty drastic. I mean, it's visually very, very different. Um, and then, you know, and whenever you expand an 18 minute short film into a 90 minute feature, there's obviously a lot more story that you can fit in there, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so I was able to really build out the characters, their backgrounds and their relationships with one another. And also in the short film, the girl who's in the chair is not Drew's fiance, it's just an actress. So, um, you know, we really upped the stakes by making the girl in the chair someone who you would care about a lot more. Let me tell you, uh, Damien, I'm a huge fan of horror genre, big fan of exorcist possession type films. And I'll tell you, The Cleansing Hour is one of the best ones out there I've seen. So oh, wow. Thank congrats, you. Yeah, really great job with you guys. So thank you. So scary, so intense, so gnarly as well. And you co-wrote this script with Aaron, correct? Yes. Uh, how did you guys come up with the, uh, you know, the, I guess the inspiration behind it? What were some of your influences for the film? Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, we, we've both worked in reality TV for a long time. And um, I personally have been an editor for over 15 years. Uh, and I've always been fascinated with by the power of editing and the way that it can manipulate people into thinking that something is real that is really fake. Um, and that's often the case in reality TV. There's very, very little that's real about reality TV. And I just sort of combine that with with my love of of exorcism horror and the idea that, you know, you could manipulate people into thinking that there's a real exorcism by making the video grainy or, you know, having a shaky cam and uh, and staging things and sort of hiding, hiding the theatrics behind the grainy video. Um, so it's sort of just it sort of just evolved from there. And um, oh, what was the second part of your question? Uh, your influences. Oh, the influences. Yeah. Well, uh, I, of course, you know, I think there are a handful of movies that uh, exorcism movies specifically that were very influential for me, aside from The Exorcist, which sort of sets the bar. You know, I'm very influenced by uh, Scott Derrickson, uh, Exorcism mm. of Emily Rose, uh, Sinister, Insidious, Lee Wannell, uh, James Wan. Those guys have, uh, I, mean, I mean, I love Mike Flanagan. I think he's so talented. Um, you know, Evil Dead. Um, I'm, I'm a big Sam Raimi fan. Uh, so that that played a big role. But then also in the writing of it, you know, I think that Joel Schumacher's phone booth played a big role as well. I mean, we there there are some similarities there, some parallels. So I definitely studied that movie and um, that played a role in the writing of, of Cleansing Hour as well. I love phone booth and I get it yeah. because, you know, uh, your movie is also set in just one location, mostly. Mm -hmm. uh, so Far be it from me to ask a magician to reveal their tricks or secrets, but I got to ask you at least one how question, mainly the effects that were used in the film. Uh, I noticed that there's a fiery effects uh, going on as, uh, on the film, and also there's, a, there's an effects for a, a certain transforma transformation, no spoilers. Uh, it looks absolutely terrifying and gooey at the same time. <laughs> what, what was that process like? And how many attempts or trial and errors before you finally get that right? Well, we didn't have many, I'll tell you that much. I focused very, very keenly on trying to have as many practical effects as possible. But, you know, there are certain caveats with working with practical effects and you don't always have more than one take. So um, the, most of the time when we were working, we only had one or two takes to pull off any of the practical effects that we had. Um, you know, the fire effect was, uh, you know, a lot of that was, um, I wanted to do, I wanted to do an actual burn, but there were certain complications uh, with doing a practical burn that uh, we just didn't have the time to do. Mm. Uh, so we did, we did digital fire, but like a lot of the fire elements, we actually shot practically. 
and we, we composited them in. Um, and then for the, the hatching effect that you're referring to, that was 100% practical effect. Wow. So um, that was it was it was very real. I've had people I've had people mistaken mistaken that for CG, and uh, that that character at the end is not CG. We we did a little bit to enhance the eyes, but otherwise it's all 100% practical, which I think is a testament to the quality of good practical effects that they should they should be used more because they feel so much more real oftentimes. I also got to say that your two leads, Ryan and Kyle did a smashing job of selling it to us, the audiences. Uh, very convincing, very committed, perfect casting. Were they always your first choices for the roles of Max and Drew? Or when did Ryan and Kyle come into the equation? Well, they came in, we, we uh, I had a casting director, we auditioned some of the roles and, um, you know, I really rely, I really leaned heavily on the casting director to help me find the right people for this because, you know, there's just with 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 movie like with certain movies, especially independent horror films, you could go so many different directions. And one of the reasons why I was happy to have my casting director was that she really opened me up to possibilities that I wouldn't have thought of myself. So after we saw Ryan, Kyle, and Alex, I mean, I, it was really wonderful because they have such a great chemistry on screen, and that's due in no small part to the fact that they get along so well off camera. They're just really lovely people. You know, they're kind of people that you want to hang out with. We all did hang out together. So um, I, I lucked out. I lucked out with the, with the talent. I, I would not have thought of them on my own. And I'm, I'm really grateful that I had such talented actors who are such nice people because it let us make the movie as good as possible and do it as quickly as possible because they're so professional. Uh, I want to ask you a big picture question here. Um, after Paranormal Activity arrived, there was a stretch of uh, found footage horror, or maybe after Blair Witch Project as well. And then after Avatar, you know, there's a bunch of movies, including horror that, oh, we're going to do 3D post-conversion, My Bloody Valentine 3D. And then after Saw arrived, there's a long stretch of other horror, like torture horror. Um, just want to ask you, uh, um, in your opinion, what will be the next uh, phase, the next fad uh, for a horror genre? I think we're in it now and it's that sort of elevated atmospheric psychological horror like the midsummers or the um you know the lodge or that sort of thing I, I think we're seeing that now that's the fad that we're in now everyone likes to call it elevated horror which i don't know if anyone could truly identify what that means but i think that i think that our you know audience has audiences have evolved a lot i think that horror audiences especially are very smart and i think that you have to be able to really think outside the box and try and push people uh, to think more in the movies because uh, they just won't accept mediocre anymore. So that's why elevated horror, so to speak, is so popular. Is this movie, your movie, is it a criticism of our society's obsession with going viral and doing whatever it takes to get views and the constant need to be deemed internet worthy? Yeah, it's a criticism. <laughs> I think, uh, um, you know, I'm, the movie's very meta, you know, we're holding up a mirror to the people who are watching it. And, uh, you know, you're watching people watching people, you know, try and fool others with their with their webcast. And, and we see the results of this sort of total narcissism and self involvement with getting a blue check mark, which is couldn't be more relevant today. Um, and then, you know, it, it, without spoiling the end, you know, it doesn't have a happy ending and it and it certainly and it certainly should allow us to reflect a little bit about the the effects that our technology and our social media are having on, on us as a society and as a culture. Uh, for my fans at home, everybody go check out The Cleansing Hour, which arrives on VOD, Digital HD and DVD January 19th. Damien, thank you for talking to me and congratulations, sir. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Roman.